I want to begin my remarks tonight by sharing a strange and troubling story from the Talmud. Um, it's set in Jerusalem under Roman rule, and the Romans are walking home from a funeral, and they see a rabbi named Rabbi Haninia ben Tradion sitting on the side of the road, the road studying Torah. Of course, um, studying Torah under Roman rule was forbidden, especially in public, because the implication was that you would be teaching Torah. So the Romans see him studying Torah, and they take hold of him. They unscroll the Sefer Torah, wrap it around him, and um, they light it on fire. Um, they place bundles of twigs around him and bring tufts of wool, which they soak in water and place over his heart so that the rabbi would not die quickly. His daughter comes, watches all of this, and says, Father, that I should see you in this state, dying alone. And the father answers, if I was being burned alone, it would have been difficult for me. But now that I am burning together with the Sefer Torah, God will have regard for the injury done to the Torah, and God will also have regard for the injury done to me. Then the rabbi's students come, and they call out, and they say, Rabbi, what do you see? We cannot believe the parchment is burning. And he answers them, the parchment is being burned, but the letters, I see them flying away. They say to him, open your mouth so that the fire can enter you, urging him to expedite his death rather than suffer. The rabbi answers, it is better that God who gave me my soul be the one to take it away, and no one should injure themselves. And the rabbi dies. What is this strange and troubling story about. It's about people seeing the exact same event in completely different ways, opposite ways. The Romans see the rabbi as a rule violator. The rabbi sees himself as the ultimate rule follower, the rule of Torah. The daughter sees her father burning alone. The rabbi sees himself as anything but alone. He sees himself as burning with the Torah. The students see the parchment burning. The rabbis see the letters illuminated, unfazed by the fire. The students tell the rabbi to submit himself to the fire. The rabbi refuses and says he will only submit himself to God's will. So what happened there? What is the truth of the story? It's all the same event, and yet we have these multiple conflicting understanding. And it begs the question, which is real? What story are we supposed to tell? How do we know what is true? Truth was a slippery subject for the rabbis in the Talmud. And maybe it's even more elusive for us today. We have cheap fakes and deep fakes, misinformation and disinformation. Every moment we have more algorithmically elevated video content to consume, another infographic, another meme. We have more and more information, but is it helping us get closer to the truth? The Danish theologian and philosopher Kierkegaard wrote it this way. When a rich man goes driving at night with the lights on his carriage, he sees a small area better than the poor man who drives in the dark, but he does not see the stars. The light prevents that. It is the same with all intellectual understanding. It sees well close at hand, but it takes away the infinite outlook. Which do you think we are? Are we like the rich man who can see a small area right in front of him very clearly? Or are we more like the poor man who cannot afford a light to see what is right in front of him, but can see the stars and the heavens quite clearly? As the literal light of the iPhone gets closer and closer to our face, I worry that our view of the world becomes more obstructed than ever. Every week in our Torah service, we sing, it is a tree of life to those who hold fast to it. Well, how do we hold fast to it? How do we cling to capital T, truth? The matter of truth for the Jewish people is an urgent one. 
there are multiple narratives and counter-narratives emerging about what it means to be a Jew from internal and external for forces. In a time when it feels like so much of what we've, been, what we've learned as the people of the book is being rewritten, holding on to the truth is more important than ever. Luckily, Judaism has a recipe for cultivating truth, and I'll give an example. Every week on Shabbat, when one of our incredible students becomes bar or bat mitzvah, in the rehearsal, they dress and undress the Torah for the first time. The Torah is awkward, <laughs> and it's slow. It's impervious to our modern desires. You can't get the cover on it quickly. It doesn't fit perfectly. It's not smooth, and it's never quite just at the right height or angle you can't really avoid almost literally wrestling with our sacred tradition. That's what the process of finding something true is like. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs wrote that truth is not something we discover at one time. That is how things are for God, but not for us. The nature of discovering truth is slow. It's a process that happens over time. It's not an image or a statistic or a screen grab. It's a mixture of experience and education that happens over time. The slowness of truth is why our Torah tells us the same stories over and over again. The story of a couple meeting at a well, the story of a barren woman who prays and receives a child, the story of the anointing of a hero. The Torah tells us these stories time and time again. Why? because it is trying to get at a truth of the human condition, which is much harder to understand than a simple recitation of facts. Knowing facts is one thing, but knowing truth takes repetition. Sometimes we feel like the fastness of information can be overwhelming. Scrolling through videos again and again and again. In those moments, it's good to remember that the walk from Egypt to Israel should have taken maybe a week, but it took us 40 years. It took us that long to understand the fragile truth of what it meant to be part of the Jewish people. Judaism thinks like, of truth like a piece of fabric that can be easily be stretched or torn. It's situational, and we ourselves are part of the situation. It's messy, imperfect, long road, and it's the one we're left to walk on. But when we do find something that is true, it's wild and it's an exhilarating relief. Because we can say it, and we know it. We need to take a risk and share it with others because truth as a practice alleviates fear. When we say it out loud, it's easier. The more we expose ourselves to our fears, the weaker they become, and the stronger we become. The Talmud asks this simple question. How do you think God signs its name? Is it yod heh vav -Hey? or Adonai, Hashem, Elohim. No, the Talmud says, none of the above. The Talmud says God signs its name with one simple word, truth, or emet, as we say in Hebrew. Truth is the signature of God. When I'm standing under the chuppah with a wedding couple, the intensity of the energy, love, anticipation, hope, commitment, and history. I see it, truth, emet. When I hear congregants calling out names in Misha Berach, our healing prayer, even though so many of us don't believe in an intervening God and yet we are praying to one, I feel it, truth, emet. When I listen to all of you singing in prayer together as one when we raise our voices and call out Avinu Malkinu, I hear it, truth, Emet. Truth is not just about the thing, it's about the essence of the thing. And maybe here, in this place, and in this space, in this year, you can allow yourself to be transported to a different way of thinking that can help you discover what is true. Because that's the type of synagogue that we are trying to build a synagogue that allows for the discovery of spiritual truth. In so many ways, what's in here is the opposite of what's out there. 
The world is digital. The synagogue is personal. The world is fast, and I admit it, the synagogue is slow. The world pressures us to trend towards sameness. The synagogue is happy to be different. The world is about cutting edge ideas. The synagogue is about ancient ones. Whether through study, prayer, or community, we are building a space that helps you uncover the infinite outlook. To see not just what is in front of us, but what's beyond us. And if I may, I want to encourage you to experiment spiritually this year, knowing that uncovering truth requires repetition. So maybe come to services, not once, but over and over again. Or light Shabbat candles, not once, not twice, but for a month, or maybe two. Or try to keep kosher, not for a meal, but for a week or a month. Try something, one Thing, and maybe some truth will present itself to you. Here is the truth, I think, from the story about Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion. Like Rabbi Hanina, we live in a violent, devastating moment. But even when it looks like we are alone, either to ourselves or to others, we are anything but. Rather, we are wrapped in a tradition that started thousands of years before us, and will continue thousands of years after. Our students and our family and our next generation are gathered by our side, standing with us, ready to tell our stories and to bear witness to our trauma. And there's a coda to the story. Ultimately, the executioner himself sees the world through Rabbi Hanina's perspective. He jumps into the fire with the rabbi and a heavenly voice emerges at that instant and invites them both to dwell together in the world to come. Uncovering truth is a rough road. It's not smooth or fast or necessarily fun, but it's spiritually urgent. And uncovering it is one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves this year. May this be a year of discovery, of looking inward, of uncovering God's signature, Shana Tovah.